Good afternoon everyone, Treasure Troller here with another episode of the Murder Book. Today we are in North Shores, Michigan. It's a small community that's in the greater Muskegon area. Right along the shores of Lake Michigan. It's a very sad, kind of complicated family murder we're going to talk about today. It had to do with untreated mental health, the inability to stay compliant on meds, but in the end it's two small children paid the price. Barley Dobbin was a 27-year-old gentleman who was married to his wife Susan. He had two children, Bartley Joel Dobbin and Peter David Dobbin. By most accounts, Bartley was, you know, was a good guy. He was a doting father. He had was popular in high school. Once he got out of high school, he started working for a foundry, and he was there up until the time of the murder. He had, at 16 years old, his mother said he started having, shall we say, a preoccupation with religion. He didn't smoke, he didn't drink, he didn't swear, which made him rather an easy target and someone who didn't have, wasn't really original with the comebacks in a uh, kind of work hard, play hard environment of a foundry. But things, things turned horribly wrong at the start of 19, in the fall of 1985. That was Bartley's first psychotic breakdown. Now I'm not sure, I've seen a couple of different ways this has been presented. I thought I heard his wife say in an Oprah show that the oldest son, Bartley, was staying with a family relative. He had a bit of a panic attack, and they thought a vacation going up north might help things out. So Susan and Bartley were going to take this vacation, and they left the child with a relative. Others say the child was with the relative. I'm, I'm not sure, but anyways, once they got heading up north, Bartley became very paranoid that something was going to happen to their child. And he raced back to this family house going 80 miles an hour down, twisting and winding roads. The police were called. Bartley was admitted into a psychiatric facility. Now they wanted Bartley to sign a voluntary admission and he wouldn't do it. So his wife had to go to court to get an involuntary stay. One of the things that prompted the involuntary stay was that Bartley was shrouding the room and the house in towels and diapers and anointing items in Bartley Joel's room with olive oil and even anointing Bartley himself and praying at all hours. So they did get him committed and he stayed in the facility for a number of months. When he came back out on the meds, he was much calmer. He seemed to not quite be himself. 
And then he and the people at the foundry knew what was going on. And once he got back to work, his co-workers would place uh, "kick me, I'm crazy" signs on his back. Um, it was a very difficult time for that. Then that year, there was the relationship was always seemed to be on the rocks. There was a lot of arguing and fighting. Barley wouldn't stand his meds, and. In 1987, they had gone rather distant with other family members. And in 1987, around Easter, there was a big, uh, Barley had a big problem with, with an Easter egg hunt. And that prompted another separation. And Barley himself filed for divorce. He had also gotten involved in a, I guess, fundamentalist church with a pastor by the name of Rude Vaughn. He was sort of a self-ordained pastor. It was kind of a days of end church. And that fit in to, to Bartley's mental health problems. Barley once again went off his meds, and during that Easter time, the they had filed for the filed for divorce. His wife had a restraining order on him, and he had broke the uh, or the protective order. He had broke the protective order within a week, and the judge could have sentenced him to forty-five days. But Barley said he had stand his meds. And then, this is what the judge said. We don't want to be back here, you know, because you've hurt someone. Definitely uh, foreshadowing things to come. So after Easter, they've been separated. He's been in this church. He's off his meds. And he begins to have another, shall we say, breakdown or continued breakdown. They begin to call Susan, the pastor and Bartley begin to call Susan Jezebel. That Bartley believes that her body language is sending signals to other men. He believes that she's having a having an affair with one of the members of KISS. He sees numbers on trucks, the license numbers and stuff. He believes they're phone numbers. He'll stop and he'll call these numbers. Things have gotten really bad for Bartley. But on Thanksgiving Day of 1987, they're trying to work things out in the relationship, they're going to go over to his parents' house, or her mother, his mother's house, for Thanksgiving dinner. And Bartley says he is left. They need to stop. Whoops, sorry. They need to stop at his place of work here at Cannon Muskegon because he's left his Bible here. And he also wants to show the kids where their father works. So they drove here. Susan, his now pregnant wife, stays in the car. Bartley takes Bartley Joel and Peter David into the foundry. Now, he had worked his way up from a janitor to a sort of control operator where he controlled the ladle that would move... 10,000 pounds of molten iron around the plant. They basically put the iron into this cauldron or into this ladle. They would bring it over a furnace. They would heat it up to 12, 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. And then they would 
purify it and make other alloys out of it. And there was, uh, I think it's called slag. That would be sort of the, the remainder, the ashes, the soot of a byproduct of this smelting process would stay in the, the ladle. Barley took his two kids in and he got into the ladle with them and he said this slag, slag, I'm sorry, the slag was like sand, it was in a sandbox. So he played with them for a couple of minutes. He got out of the ladle, he closed the lid on it, and he turned on the furnace. He calmly started walking out of the facility. Now, it was closed during Thanksgiving. The only person that was here was a security guard. The security guard kind of wondering what's up because he came in with two kids. When the security guard asked him where the kids were, he said they're in the furnace. And the security guard said, did they fall in there? And he said, no, I put them in there. There was no denying what he did. Um, Barley James, the coroner said the kids died from, well, suffocation basically. The death came fairly quick. So he was put on trial and after the trial took a couple of years because they had three different competency hearings. Because first, it's because he's not on meds, whatnot. Then they have another competency hearing after a certain period of time because they start putting him on psych psychotropics. And then they had a third. He was found competent initially, then incompetent, and then competent to stand trial. And after a nine day trial, he was found guilty of murder with mental illness. Now, as far as the legal side of this thing goes, it brought up a rather interesting thing in Michigan law. For instance, if he would have been found uh, like not guilty, he would have spent like 60 to 90 days in a facility and then that would have been it. But he has spent, uh, he received two life sentences and he's in the psychiatric unit of a prison here in Michigan serving out life sentences. Now his brother he had a jury trial. His brother wanted Bartley to have a bench trial. Uh, but that request was denied. Susan <laughs> Susan kind of said this was not she went on Oprah in 1989 to discuss the murder and her forgiveness. She said that uh, this was not the, the husband she knew. She wanted him out of jail and home. She wanted to stop the divorce. And uh, she just wanted to maybe move out of the area and have be uh, reunified with with Bartley. So there hasn't been a real Bartley never really said why he did this. If you ask the prosecuting attorney, he'll say it was planned. The motive was getting back at uh, 
uh, Suzanne because of her being a Jezebel and her flirtatious attitude with other men. If you ask Ruud Vaughn, the pastor of that church, he'll say, well, it's the family pressure. You know, he had the two kids, a third on the way, a wife and a house. The pressures of living got to him. And if you ask his family members and friends, they'll say it was the religious preachings of Rude Vaughn. Because he had gone off his meds. He was encouraged to go off his meds. And they had also read some type. They had talked about how the children of, uh, I guess justice would come to the children of, of a Jezebel. And also, Rue, or, uh, Bartley had been Bartley had been um, reading about cleansing souls through fire. His paranoid schizophrenia had also um, materialized into children that were coming up missing in the Muskegon area were actually being burned. in that ladle at the foundry. The, the church was kind of a end of days, I don't want to say cult, but an end of days church. He believed, Barley believed God was coming soon to, to fix things. I think a couple years later, maybe Susan did eventually divorce Bartley. And uh, she basically died that same year. There's nothing about the, uh, the third child, what became of them. And the Dobbin brothers, Bartley Joel and his brother, Peter David. They are buried in an unmarked grave in a cemetery here in Muskegon. There's also a podcast out there called Crime Curious that does a in-depth review of this case so if you want to know more about it maybe more specific details about it uh, feel free to uh, check out their podcast they do uh, they do a really good job so for the murder book this is treasure troller saying aloha and good day